God's peace be with you in Christ our Lord. My name is Michael Larson, a parish pastor at Luther Memorial Chapel and University Student Center in Shorewood, Wisconsin. Today we celebrate the feast day or festival of the Holy Trinity. Our gospel is taken from St. John, chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Grace, mercy, and peace be unto you from God our Father and from our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. This day is set aside for us to contemplate and to give thanks for the Holy Trinity. God is triune. God has revealed himself to us as Father and as Son and Holy Spirit. That's who God is. We worship and adore the Holy Trinity. We acknowledge that God is one. Not three gods, but one God. He is truly one God, but also a communion of loving persons, a communion and relationship of love, a holy fellowship and family to which we have all been invited. Through baptism, we entered into this holy life of the triune God. Jesus sends his apostles out to do just this, to make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Dear friends, this confession of the Holy Trinity is the greatest mystery of the Christian faith. So, how was the doctrine of the Trinity first laid out for you? Maybe with some form of an analogy, an apple, a clover, water, liquid, ice, and steam. Maybe the triangle to explain the three and one and one and three. Now, let us not pass judgment on our teachers here for trying to explain the Trinity, but whatever analogy was being used, they all fell short. Because God is not an apple or H2O or even a triangle for that matter. He is the almighty God, a communion of love, a relationship of loving persons. For a much better illustration, just look at the painting on the cover of your bulletin for this morning. Giuseppe de Ribera, a Spanish painter of the 17th century. There is Christ, the crucified, the Son of the Father. His arms, his pierced limbs are stretched out, draped over the knees and lap of his Father, recalling his suffering on the cross. In this beautiful painting, the Father seems to be inviting us in, presenting his Son to us, a Son who, out of great love for his Father and for us also, was crucified for our salvation and raised for our justification. The Holy Spirit hovers over this merciful, forgiving Son of God, and the Spirit makes this love known to us. But bust yet to contemplate the Holy Trinity is not the eyes so much as it is the ears. In the Creed, we confess our faith in God as creator of the heavens and the earth, and of all things visible and invisible. And as Christians, we live and orient our whole lives toward realities not seen, living in the promises of God in the glorious age yet to come. On this feast of the Holy Trinity, the Church in her wisdom lays before us Isaiah, our first reading. It's a time when the words and promises of God come together with the eyes in an amazing vision. One thing important to understand is that the liturgy of the temple was a point of connection between the unseen world and the visible world, between heaven and earth. There was God's word, sacrifice and blood, and promises of the Lord. For Isaiah, in our reading today, earth dropped away, and heaven became visible. And Isaiah saw the Lord high and lifted up, and the train of his robe filling the temple. And above him the seraphim, six-winged angels, covered their faces in humility before the Lord of all. And they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord of hosts. Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. And the whole temple... Its foundation shook the voice of the heavenly seraphim, and the smoke and incense filled the whole place. Now, notice how Isaiah responds to coming into the presence of God. He doesn't say, wow, isn't this great? No way. 
Instead, it's woe is me, for I am lost. I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of a people of unclean lips. For my eyes have seen the King, the Lord of hosts. Isaiah thought he was dead meat in the presence of God. Woe is me, I'm sinful through and through. And how can I come into the presence of God? And you ought to know where he's coming from here. Because truth be told, there is nothing in your fallen flesh too, but sin and death. We are men and women and children of unclean lips. We have not lived as we should. We have not spoken as we ought. So how can you possibly expect to worship the Holy Trinity with body and soul? How can you dare reach out and take the holy body and precious blood of Christ, the Son of God, upon your unclean lips? How can you eat and drink the Lord himself with mouth and lips and tongue that have lied and cursed and gossiped and profaned the name of God? How can you possibly stand before God and ascend in heart and mind and soul unto the Lord your God in heaven? How shall you ever enter into God's kingdom and participate in the life of God? Well, dear friends, today I bring you good news from your Father who is in heaven. You cannot ascend to God or enter into his heaven, for he himself has come down to you. He has descended from the heart of his Father to you to embrace you in love. Listen to the words of our Lord this morning. No one has ascended into heaven except he who descended from heaven, the Son of Man. And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whoever believes in him may have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his Son into the world to condemn the world, but in order that the world might be saved through him. That's why when Isaiah stood before the Lord and confessed his sin, God did not destroy him. Instead, one of those seraphs, those winged angels, grabbed some tongs and flies over to the altar to pluck up a fiery burning coal and heads over to Isaiah to sear his lips. But this pain is not bad, but good. Because the angel whispered to Isaiah, Behold, this has touched your lips. Your guilt is taken away and your sin atoned for. Dear friends, this is God's answer for your sin. For God so loved the world that he gave his only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. In Jesus, you have the perfect image of the Father. Jesus says, whoever has seen me has seen the Father. You see, in Christ we see the Father's heart unveiled in love. And this love is not some attribute or a characteristic of God. Instead, the Apostle John in Holy Scripture simply writes that God is love. When Isaiah beheld the glory of the Lord, he cried out, Woe is me, for the sinner cannot stand in the presence of a holy God and live. But God the Father lifted up his Son Jesus for you on the cross, so that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. This eternal life of Christ is given to you by the Holy Spirit's good pleasure in baptism. Unless one is born again of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. But praise be to him that you have entered into this gift of holy baptism. You've been born again with eyes to see and ears to hear. And the Spirit of God has called you to faith in the triune God of love. This morning... Once again, God has sent a messenger, a pastor, to press the burning coal of absolution to your lips, to say, in the stead and by the command of my Lord Jesus Christ, I forgive you all of your sins, in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Those fiery words of absolution make you worthy to come into the presence of God and receive upon your lips the living body and blood of Christ who loves you. The seraphim and angels whisper also in your ears, saying, Your guilt is taken away, and your sin atoned for. 
having received forgiveness and life from the Father through the Son by the Holy Spirit, we join with the angels in praising the Blessed Trinity. Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God of Sabaoth. Heaven and earth are full of thy glory. Amen. May the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen.